Hello, my name is Johann Freudenberg from Hanover, Germany. Do you think we are in a commodity bubble? Thank you. Well, certainly, not in, in, in agricultural com commodities. They haven't, they haven't done anything. If you're talking about wheat or corn or soybeans or something, but if you get into the metals, oil, um, you know, we there's been a terrific move. Uh, the most extreme probably has been copper, and I would say that well, um, oil. If you go back a few years to when it was ten dollars a barrel, it's been more extreme than copper. But you are undoubtedly. It's like it's like most it's like most uh, trends. At the beginning, it's driven by fundamentals, and at some point, speculation takes over. The very fact that pe the fundamentals cause something that people have looked at for years uh, without getting excited about fundamentals change the picture in some way. <clears throat> Copper does get a little short, you know, or or people get a little worried about currency, and maybe gold goes up or whatever it may be. Uh, but, you know, it's that old story of what, what the wise man does in the beginning, the fool does in the end. And with any asset class that has a big move that's based initially on fundamentals is going to <clears throat> attract speculative, <clears throat> speculative uh, participation at some point, and that speculative participation can become dominant as time goes by, and, and uh, you know, famous case always being tulip bulbs. I mean, tulips may have been more attractive than dandelions or something, so people paid a little more money for them. But once once a price history develops that causes people to start looking at an asset that they never looked at before and to get envious of the fact that they're because he saw this early and so on, that takes over. And uh, my guess is that uh, we're seeing some of that in the commodity area. And of course, I think we've seen some of it in the housing area too. How far it goes, you never know. I mean, it just, some things go on to just unbelievable heights. Uh, and then, you know, silver went back in there. That was manipulation to some extent, but it got up to fifty dollars an ounce very briefly back in the early '80s. Um, but the eyes of the world that never looked at silver when it was a dollar sixty or something, or dollar thirty back in the '60s, you know, everybody in the world was looking at it, and some were shorting and some were buying. But it becomes a speculative football. And my guess is that an awful lot of the activity in something like copper now is is speculative on both sides of the market. If, if uh, and it, you know, if it goes to five dollars a pound, who knows? But it, you are looking at a a market that is is responding more to speculative forces now than to fundamental forces, in my view. Charlie. Well, I think we've demonstrated how little we know about commodity prices by our very skillful operations in silver. I, I think you you can change that from R to it's mine. Actually, I I I. I I bought it very early. I sold it very early. Uh, other than that, everything I did was perfect. I mean, <laughs> we managed to minimize things there with great efficiency. <laughs> or I managed to. Charlie didn't have anything to do with that. I was the silver king there for a while. <laughs> we, we, we did make a few dollars on it. But uh, we're, we're, not, we're, we're not good at the game of when it gets into the speculative area, figuring out how far a speculative boom will go. And, um, and we, if the fundamentals are attractive, we think we're getting a lot for our money, buying equities or whatever it may be, uh, we'll make some money. We, we, will pro we may not make as much money, remotely as much money, as, as, as somebody who is, uh, you know, plays out the last 30 days or 30 weeks of a of a real wild orgy. I mean, these things, they tend to be the wildest toward the end. But that gets back to the question, you know, of Cinderella of the ball. I mean, you, you know, you, you're there, you're having a wonderful time, the punch bowl is flowing, and the, the dance partners are getting prettier all the time, and you know at midnight it, it's going to turn to pumpkins and mice. And, you know, you look around the room, and you think just one more dance, one more good-looking guy, you know, one more glass of champagne, and you think you're going to get out of there at midnight. And of course, everybody else thinks they're going to get out of there at midnight too. And 
in the end, it does turn to pumpkins and mice. And in this game, as I've said, you know, Adam Smith said it many years ago, a fellow named Jerry Goodman wrote under the pseudonym of Adam Smith, says the problem with that particular dance for Cinderella is that there are no clocks on the wall, you know, and, and in, the, in, in, the, in the markets, if you're talking copper now, if you're talking internet stocks in 1999, if you're talking uranium stocks in the 1950s, there are no clocks on the wall. And the party does get to be more fun, you know, minute after minute, hour after hour, and then it does turn to pumpkins and mice.